Hi. Um, I wanted to just talk with you guys briefly um, about pathophysiology. That's a big chapter. It's got a lot of big words in it. I'm sure it's a little bit hard to understand when you're just trying to read through it. So I wanted to pull out some of, just a couple, and I may do one other short video for you with some other things, but uh, a couple of the really important things that happen with pathophysiology. So you understand how the body's put together, you understand some of the parts, um, but let's talk about what happens when those things don't work. So we're going to grab a couple pearls here. Okay, First thing that you need to understand is that um, our cells have a process in which they burn sugar and make energy out of it. So our cells have to have two things, oxygen and sugar. And when they don't have those things, they don't work very well. So let's talk about the oxygen aspect of that really quick. Okay? So when our cells have oxygen, if you think of your cell as a little, I don't know, little factory or a little um, combustion engine maybe, okay? it's got to have fuel to burn and it's got to have oxygen to burn it. Okay? So normally when our cell has both of those, it's going to take the sugar and it puts it through a process, and you may hear this process mentioned later, but it's going to be put through this process. We call it the Krebs cycle, and that's a horrible thing to have to learn because it's got, oh gosh, two dozen steps that are in this process, and it deals with all the little intricate parts of the cell. But let's just suffice to say that there's a process, and sometimes it's called cellular respiration. Um, and there's a process where our cell takes those things, burns it, and makes energy. And so if it has its sugar and it has oxygen, it's going to produce uh, 32 to 34 units of energy. And we're going to call those units ATP because it's a really big, long name, and ATP is much easier to understand. Okay. So it's just a, our cell with each cycle produces about 34 ATP units of energy. Now it uses that energy to, uh, to survive and do its functions. So our muscle cells are going to use that energy to contract and, and be able to function for us. Um, and each of our cells has a different function, so that energy is going to help them to be able to function as they should. Now if we take the oxygen away, um, oh, first of all, down here. When all that process is happening, we call that aerobic metabolism. Okay, So it's just kind of like uh, when you're doing aerobics, you've got oxygen, you've got sugar, you're burning that, and so we call those aerobics because those cells are very quickly working through this process to produce energy for you. If we take the oxygen out of the picture for whatever reason, then our body goes into what we call anaerobic metabolism. And in anaerobic metabolism, move my face down here, whoops. Um, maybe. Um, in anaerobic metabolism, I apparently can't move me. There we go. Um, in anaerobic metabolism, we still run through the cycle, but it does it without the oxygen. So it's able to produce energy, but using this particular cycle, it's only going to produce two units. So we're not going to have the energy that we did. We're not going to be able to provide the cellular function that we did. And the complete downside of this is that cycle, that type of cycle, which we call anaerobic, so it's kind of like opposite of aerobic, um, produces a ton of lactic acid. And lactic acid is um, detrimental. It destroys things. And so when the cell is working in the anaerobic metabolism, uh, it's producing only two units of energy and building up all of this acid, which eventually ends up destroying the cell altogether. So it's kind of a last-ditch effort for that cell to survive. 
and um, it, it may buy it a little time, but in the end the cell is going to deteriorate. So if you look back at the aerobic metabolism, you can see these cells have a nice little cell wall. This is actually a real photograph. Uh, a cell wall, they've got lots of little things inside there that we're not even gonna mess with right now. And you've got that nice healthy nucleus. When we go to anaerobic metabolism, the nucleus is still there, but you can see we no longer have a healthy cell wall. In fact, we really don't have a cell shape at all. And these um, cells are starting to to deteriorate and die. Okay. So that being said, we have to understand that we've got to have oxygen to make our bodies work and to keep our cells alive. For whatever reason, if we lose that oxygen, this is what's going to happen. So there could be dozens of reasons why we would lose oxygen. <coughs> um, Maybe we've got uh, pneumonia and we've got pus and inflammation and stuff in our lungs and we can't um, get the oxygen in and get it diffused. Okay. Now let's talk about respiration and ventilation. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the upcoming airway section, but I think it's important for you to understand. Um, when we get that respiration, is when, now, now this is different than cellular respiration. Uh, this is respiration in our, in our lungs. Our body breathes in the oxygen and our cells are coming back into the lungs and they're bringing back carbon dioxide, which is waste from the cells, okay? So they delivered the cells the oxygen, they picked up the carbon dioxide and they're bringing it back to the cell. And so when that blood moves around that alveoli, that little air pockets in the lungs, and then we'll, we'll have a little um, capillary that wraps around that alveoli. It's about one cell thick. And in there are our red blood cells. Okay. So those red blood cells, when they're coming back to the lungs, are carrying carbon dioxide, and our lung has oxygen. And so that's a very thin membrane between the alveoli and that um, capillary in the pulmonary system. And so it's thin enough that that oxygen can exchange. So the carbon dioxide jumps into the lung, the oxygen jumps onto the red blood cell, and it moves on. Now our blood is oxygenated, and when we exhale, we exhale out the carbon dioxide that was um, created by our cells. So when it's, when our, body is on aerobic metabolism, we produce carbon dioxide as a waste product. When we're in anaerobic metabolism, we produce lactic acid, and we can't get rid of that. That stays there. I mean, we can, but not when we're sick like that. Okay. So that gas exchange across that membrane in the pulmonary system, in the lungs, is what we call respiration. Okay? Now ventilation is the act of pulling air into our lungs. So we can provide, as in like when we do CPR, we're providing artificial ventilations. So we're getting air into the lungs. If that gas exchange is the respiration, and that's what we can't always know is happening. So if you've got somebody that's got, like we say, pneumonia, or asthma and there's um, mucus and stuff in the lungs, that's going to prevent that gas exchange from happening. So we're going to get ventilation, but we're not going to get the respiration. And we call that VQ mismatch. Okay, So we're breathing, we're getting the air in and out, but we're not getting oxygen into our body. Okay, And that can happen for a number of reasons. The pneumonia, asthma could help it. If we've got a, let's say we've got a big blood clot. I'm going to move here. Um, here's our heart and it's pumping blood out into the lung. If we get a blood clot right here, we're still going to be able to move air in and out of the lungs because our air passageway isn't blocked, but we're not going to get the blood around those little alveoli 
so it's not going to get oxygenated. So we're going to be moving air in and out and be very short on oxygen. So your patients are going to feel like they're suffocating because they can't get the oxygen and it's due to a blood clot. Or maybe you have a patient who's uh, been hurt and they're bleeding or maybe they have a bleeding ulcer uh, inside and they're bleeding internally. Um, so in that case we're moving air in and out because none of that has damaged our lungs. So we're able to ventilate to move that air in and out but we're not getting that gas exchange because the, the blood isn't there. Um, we're low on red blood cells because we're bleeding it out and so we're going to get that VQ mismatch or that ventilation perfusion mismatch. Okay, So we're, we're breathing but we're not perfusing, we're not getting oxygen to the cells that need it because of a blood issue. Um, same thing might happen if you have a patient that's severely dehydrated. Okay. Uh, we've got things that are there, so the air is coming in and out, that's working fine. The blood flow, I mean we've got red blood cells in our, in our bloodstream, we've got white blood cells, we've got platelets, but we're low on plasma because we're dehydrated. And so our blood pressure is going to drop because um, we don't have the volume in our vessels and so when that happens then we're, uh, we can't move the oxygen around because the solution that we move it in is the plasma and that's missing a lot of that plasma because of our dehydration state. So there's lots of things and we'll, as we go through we're going to kind of talk about um, what some of those things are that um, with our medical emergencies and our trauma injuries that would cause us to not be able to get oxygen to our cells because if we can't do that we are going to suffer and perhaps um, not survive. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about so let's talk just a little bit um, about our heart and pulmonary system because this plays a big huge part in a lot of things so we're going to just very briefly go over the know and know the flow of the heart know how that blood flows through the heart so if you look on the diagram here we've got this big vein and that's the superior vena cava and if you look down here at the bottom is the inferior vena cava those are those two very large veins that carry deoxygenated blood so it's bringing the blood back from the tissue in the bodies back to the heart and it's carrying all of that carbon dioxide with it. So those are going to come back to the heart and that blood gets dumped right into this right ventricle. Okay? I mean, I'm sorry, right atrium. And the two atriums, here's the right atrium and over here's the left atrium, they aren't very big and they aren't very muscular because they're just holding stations for the blood. So the blood's going to come in and there's a valve down here at the bottom and you can see that that blood's going to, for the most part, flow by gravity right down through that valve and into the ventricle. Now the, the ventricles are our pumping stations. So they have thick muscular walls because they have a big job. So this right ventricle, his job is to pump the blood out to the lungs. Remember this blood is, doesn't have oxygen. So it's going to pump it out to the lungs and when that alveoli is there, that little capillary is going to wrap around and it's going to exchange. So the carbon dioxide from the blood is going to jump into the lung, that little alveoli, and the oxygen that's in the lungs is going to jump on the red blood cell. And we're going to have um, respirations when that happens. And then when the blood comes back, it's going to um, come back into this left ventricle. So you can see when it gets pumped out, it's going to come down into the right ventricle, and the right ventricle is going to pump it out. I hope you can see my little cursor. It's going to pump it out through the pulmonary artery. Okay, and this is the only artery in the body that carries deoxygenated blood. Okay. 
But if you can always remember, arteries carry blood away from the heart and veins carry blood back to the heart, you'll always be right. Okay. So it's going to take it out, pump it around the vessel, into the vessels in the pulmonary system around the lungs. And then when it comes back, it's going to kind of go behind the heart and it's going to dump right in to this right ventricle. I mean left ventricle. Gosh, I can't talk. It's going to come from the lungs into the left atrium. Okay, And then again, it's going to flow downhill and it's going to collect in that left ventricle, which is our really big pumping station because that is now going to pump it right out and it's going to shoot right under here and up into the aorta and out to the body. Okay, So that's a big old muscular thing. Now let's throw this caveat in here. Okay. Well, first, let me do this. Let's talk about our valves. Okay, there's four valves in the heart. The first one is right here, from the right atrium to the right ventricle. There's a valve there. And what happens is when that blood comes down through, this valve, I don't know if I can do this, is open. Okay, and let's see here. I'll do it this way. I'm trying to do this in a webcam and it's backwards, so it's kind of like doing things in a mirror. Okay, so that valve is open, and it's it's going to be open kind of down this way, and then when the ventricle gets full, that valve closes. So when the ventricle squeezes, the blood doesn't go right back up into the atrium. Okay, so this first one is called the tricuspid valve. Okay? The next valve is when we pump it out here, it's going to go through the pulmonary valve. And then the same thing happens on the left side. When it comes in, it's going to go through a valve here that's called the mitral valve or the bicuspid. Either That, that one has two names and either one are, are correct. And then when it pumps out to the aorta, it's going to go through a valve called the aortic valve. Now, that's a lot to remember, but I have a little thing. Don't laugh at my drawing here. Okay, You see my little drawing here? Here's Johnny. He's in the outhouse, and it's this little drawing right here. And I don't know if you can see. Let's see if I can make this bigger. All right. There's Johnny. He's in the outhouse, and he's missing his toilet paper, which is kind of a big deal. So he's hollering at his ma, and he's like, TP, ma, need TP. I told you it was dumb, but it works. Okay, That is the order of your valves. So it's tricuspid, pulmonary, mitral, aorta, or aortic valve. So that is your little mnemonic to help remember the valves and in what order the blood goes through them. Okay, So again, here's our tricuspid, pulmonary, mitral, and then when it pumps out to the aorta, there's one there, and that's called your aortic valve. Okay, so kind of important to remember those and um, know where those happen. Okay. Now, let's throw this caveat into the mix because this is um, important to remember because you're going to take care of patients that have these issues. So we know how the blood flows through the heart. We know that our ventricles are our big pumping stations. Let's say we have a patient that has a heart attack. Okay? And a heart attack is that there's a clot in the arteries that feed those cardiac muscles. And we get a clot in there, and so part of that cardiac muscle in the right ventricle dies because it can't get oxygen. It goes into anaerobic metabolism and those cells die, and we no longer have function in that part of the heart. So let's say a big chunk of this left ventricle right here isn't working anymore. So the rest of our pump is pumping station is still going to try and do its job, but we're not going to have the output from that part of the heart that we did before. So let's think about how this is going to affect us. Okay, Blood comes in normally. Okay, There's nothing broken there. So the blood comes in, it goes to the right ventricle, 
that's all we're confined. It gets pumped through the lungs, gets loaded up with oxygen. That's working fine. It comes back over here into the left atrium. That works fine. It comes down here into the left ventricle, and the left ventricle can't pump it out as quickly as it's coming in because it's damaged. So this blood is going to back up because it's still coming in, it's still getting pumped into the left ventricle, but it can't get pumped out as quickly. So it's going to back up to the left atrium, and then it's going to back up into our pulmonary system here. So those veins in our lungs, that pulmonary veins, are going to get more and more and more pressure in them. And remember we talked about our bodies always trying to maintain a state of balance. Well, if we have veins that are high pressure and tissues around them that aren't, that isn't balanced. So our body's going to try and equal that out for two reasons, because it likes to balance it. And if we don't, those veins are, and vessels, arteries are going to get damaged. So this is what we call hydrostatic pressure. Okay? Hydrostatic pressure is when we balance this out, we're going to move that fluid. So we've got our, our vessel wall, okay? and we've got a lot of pressure on this side and not much over here. So we're going to move some fluid, and what we're going to move across is the water, the plasma, the water that's in the plasma. We're just going to move it across that membrane into the tissues on the other side. Now, unfortunately, these vessels are in the lungs. So the tissues on the other side is our lung, is our little alveoli air sacs. So when we move that fluid across to create balance, we're actually pushing water into the lungs. And these patients are going to have breathing problems because they're literally drowning. And if we don't fix that, their lungs can fill completely up with fluid and we'll drown them. Okay? So that is hydrostatic pressure that's moving the, or osmosis. Okay, the pressure causes it. Osmosis is the process of that water moving across. Um, now let's, these patients are going to tell you they're short of breath. When you listen to their lungs, you're going to hear water in their lungs. We'll get to that here in a week or so. Um, and if it continues, they oftentimes will cough up uh, frothy sputum. So it's like they're coughing up foam. And it's that they're, they're breathing through this water. And it's got a little bit of mucus. I mean, your lungs have mucus in them. And so that mucus mixes with the water. And as they continue to breathe through and through and through, it becomes foamy. And it will fill up their lungs. And they'll be coughing it up and hacking it up. Uh, and they're, they're drowning. So let's look at what would happen if... Now, that's, that's what we just talked about is left-sided heart failure, right? Let's move that heart attack over to the right side of the heart. Okay. So if our right pump isn't working, then we've got blood coming into the heart, and it goes down to the right atrium, goes right down into that right ventricle, and it can't go anywhere else because that pumping station isn't pumping so good. So it's really not able to pump the fluid to the lungs adequately. So this is going to back up into the right atrium, and then it's going to back up into that vena cava or into our veins. Now, if you think about where that vena cava comes into the heart, that's very close to our jugular veins. So in these patients, um, we all have, if we lay down, you'll be able to see your jugular veins on either side of your neck. But these patients, sitting up, are going to have distended jugular veins. We call that JVD, uh, jugular vein distension. And you'll see that. So that's telling us that um, the pressure in our veins, in that uh, veins that are coming back to the heart, is high. And again, 
we've got that hydrostatic pressure that's going to kick in. When those veins get full of fluid and that pressure gets high, then we're going to have to get that state of balance. So again, fluid water from the plasma is going to go across the vein wall and it's going to go into the tissues uh, around it. Those tissues are going to be our tissues, so it's going to just go into our our tissues and our muscles and our whatever, there's tons of tissues there. Um, and that water is going to tend to settle. When it goes into the lungs, it settles in the lower part of the lung. When it goes into the body, it's going to settle into the lower part of the body. So oftentimes you'll see these people with swollen ankles. If you don't know if a patient has swollen ankles or if they're just chubby, just push your finger into them. You should be able to your skin should bounce right back when you push on it, it should come right back. People with swollen ankles, when you push on it, it'll leave a finger indent there. We call that pitting edema, that there's, your fingerprint will stay in there for a while. So if that's the case, you know that that patient very likely has right-sided heart failure. Now the only time that doesn't really apply is if you've got a pregnant woman, and sometimes you get um, in pregnancy you'll get that edema in your ankles. That's, um, it, that's a whole nother pregnancy issue. It's not a heart issue. Um, but otherwise, we're gonna, we can probably safely assume that they have right-sided heart failure. And if you talk to those patients, they'll probably tell you that they had a heart attack at some point in time, okay, or they have heart problems. Okay. So that is hydrostatic pressure, and that's how it works in this area. So it kind of looks like this. Okay. Again, we talked about our bodies always trying to um, maintain a state of balance. So with this particular, let's look over here on this side. Um, we've got a lot more solutes over here than we do over here. And this down the middle is a, what we call a semi-permeable membrane. Um, and so water can go across that, and we're going to call this osmosis. To balance that out, the water from over here can just move over here, like it shows in this picture over um, on the other side. So now if you look at that, um, instead of being the same size of container, one container is bigger than the other, but the ratio is the same. So our solutes and water are the same ratio and that balance that out by the process of osmosis. Now sometimes, and this is hydrostatic pressure that does this, okay? sometimes we will have, let me see if I can figure out how to get me into this, okay. um, so let's say we've got this little cell here or this vessel that has a lot of particles or solutes if you will, um, inside and very little outside. So instead of the, um, in this particular case, instead of the water moving across, because the water is going to, if we move enough water in here to balance this out, let's say this is a little cell, it's going to explode the cell, okay, or explode the vessel. And so other times we have what we call osmotic pressure or osmotic pull, and what that's going to do is it pulls the solutes across, okay? And, it, and sometimes those smaller particles can move across those membranes. So either way that it works out, it's always creating balance. And sometimes in that process of creating balance, it creates more problems. More often than not, it's balancing out and it's keeping us on track to stay healthy. But on occasion, you get these processes that cause problems. And if we understand the process, then we can think through what's going on with this patient and be able to figure out what's, um, what's potentially happening and how maybe we can fix that. Okay? So I hope I didn't really confuse you with the hydrostatic and osmotic pressures. But if you can understand that state of homeostasis and balance, a lot of this will make sense. Okay? I hope this helps a little. Um, 
I'll dig through your pathophysiology chapter a little more, and if there's any more pearls that I think we need to pull out of there so that you really understand, I will get those in a little video for you. Otherwise, good luck in your class. You're doing awesome, and we will visit with you soon.